So the, um, the right reading didn't make itself available until, until late. I first thought I would go to an academic source and, and read something um, with academic sophistication about Buddhism and its, uh, how it's changed in the West. And then I couldn't find anything that you'd stay awake for. And then I thought, oh, I will, I will read in a sort of an obscure to me Buddhist text. And then I thought, well, that will probably only confuse things more. Um, Instead, I found a Buddhist children's story. The followers of Buddha went out each day with their begging bowls to beg for their meals. And each day, their path led them to a different part of town. One day, their path led them past some holy men These holy men lay naked, prostrate on beds of thorns in hope that this would make them more holy. Next, Buddha's followers passed another group of holy men who had set a bonfire and then under the hot, hot sun sat as close as they could stand, closer than they could stand to the bonfire in hope that the heat would purify them. Buddha's followers went on, collected their meals in their begging bowls, and returned to the Buddha. Buddha, said one of the followers, when we were out getting our food this morning, we walked past holy men lying naked on cruel sharp thorns, sitting next to a blazing fire under a blazing hot sun, Will doing this make them any more holy? No, said Buddha. Lying on thorns will not make you more holy. Baking yourself under the sun will not make you more holy. Such things are just like the horrible noise that was heard by the timid rabbit. The followers looked at each other, and one of them at last said, Buddha, we have not heard of the timid rabbit or the great noise. Once upon a time, there was a little rabbit who lived in a forest by the Western Ocean. This rabbit went to live in a beautiful grove of trees and made his home at the foot of the Bengal quince tree, the kind of tree under which the god Shiva, god of destruction, was said to have lived. One fine day, the little rabbit sat under the quince tree, nibbling grass and thinking about what would happen if the world got destroyed by Shiva. At just that moment, a large, hard Bengal quince fell off the tree and hit the ground directly behind the rabbit. The earth is being destroyed cried the little rabbit, and he immediately started running as fast as he could away from the sound. Another rabbit and then another saw him running with terror. What's going on, the rabbits asked. The earth is being destroyed, cried the little rabbit, and soon all of the rabbits were running. They passed some wild pigs, told them that the earth is being destroyed, and so the wild pigs joined, as did the deer and the buffaloes, the rhinoceroses, the tigers, and even the elephants, all of them running, crying out, the earth is being destroyed. Now in another part of the forest, there lived a good and kind lion. She saw all of the animals running and heard them shouting, the earth is being destroyed. Run for your lives, they screamed. The lion was wise enough to see that this was not true. And she could also see that the animals were so frightened that they would run into the Western Ocean where they would drown. The lion was good and kind and also fast. So ran in front of them, cut them off at the pass, and stopped them by roaring three times. The lion said to the animals when they stopped, Why are you all running? And all the animals cried together, The earth is being destroyed. How do you know, said the lion. 
one of the animals said, oh, the elephants must have seen it. Uh, the elephant said, no, not us. The tigers saw it. The tigers said, not us, the rhinoceroses. The rhinoceroses said they heard it from the buffalo, the buffalo from the wild pigs, the wild pigs from the rabbits. And the rabbits all turned to the little timid rabbit. The lion asked the little rabbit, what did you see? The little rabbit said, I was under my tree at my home when I heard the earth start to break apart behind me. The lion knew that the Bengal quinces were starting to ripen, and she knew that one of the fruits had fallen and startled the timid rabbit. The kind lion had the little rabbit jump on her back, and they ran off to where they had seen the earth breaking. And when they got to the Bengal quince tree, the little rabbit pointed in terror and said, There, there, that's where the earth, I heard the earth breaking up. And there on the ground, there was a ripe quince. The good lion went back and told all of the other animals what she had found. And the other animals sighed in relief. And everything returned to normal. So it is, said the Buddha, that you should not listen to rumors. And you should not listen to the fears of other people. You should try to find out the truth for yourselves. Be ye lamps unto yourselves. And then the Buddha said, Be like that lion. Be like that lion. Stop others for, from harming themselves for no reason at all. Thus ends the reading. Thank you, Dorothy, for uh, giving us music. And, and Glenn, thank you. Thank you both of you for giving us... music this morning that sets such a, a meditative and fitting tone to the service. So back in September, I was preparing to give a lecture about the theological diversity in our congregation. Um, and so as part of my research for that lecture, I emailed a member of the search committee and asked uh, that search committee member to kind of resend me the results of the survey that people in this congregation had completed about two years ago uh, as part of the ministerial search process. One of the questions on this survey asked, in addition to Unitarian Universalism, what faith traditions are important to your religious development? An astounding, astounding 63% of those who took the survey indicated that Buddhism, Buddhism was important to your religious development. That was far and away the most popular choice. By comparison, only 40% replied that religious humanism was important to your religious development. Only half as many as Buddhism, 31% said Christianity was important to your religious development. A third as many as Buddhism, 21% cited Judaism as important. And Buddhism was 10 times more likely than neo-paganism or Islam to be cited as important to your religious development. And I found, as I was doing this research, I found these numbers striking. Now take a look at the people on either side of you. Chances are two out of the three of you, if you completed the survey, claimed that Buddhism was important to your religious development. So honestly, the first thing I thought when I reread these surveys, the first thing I felt was insecurity. I thought, oh, I'm going to have to work a lot more Buddhism into my ministry here. <laughs> In case you haven't noticed yet, my own personal religious and spiritual interests lean much more towards the West than the East. Now, let me be clear. I don't dislike Buddhism. I don't dislike Hinduism or Taoism. It's just that when I choose sermon topics or religious education classes or books that I want to read, chances are pretty good that it will have to do with Judaism or Christianity or Unitarian Universalist history or the Western intellectual and philosophical tradition. 
And of course, when creating the worship calendar, I know that we're going to celebrate Christmas and Easter and Yom Kippur. We probably won't celebrate the Buddhist New Year or Visakha, Puha, or Bodhi Day. So my first thought was a little bit of insecurity. If 63% of you say that Buddhism is significant, I need to figure out a way to bring more Buddhism into our religious life together. That led to my second thought. The next thing I thought was not exactly a thought that I am proud to have thought, because it was a rather judgmental thought. And my first thought was kind of like insecurity, and my second thought was, was kind of blame. Um, I wondered if those filling out the survey had actually been truthful. <laughs> I racked my brain trying to think of times in which Buddhist spirituality had been evident in our life together, and for a moment I considered whether I should challenge the claim, and I toyed with the idea of handing out a pop quiz this morning. <laughs> I'm going to take out a piece of paper and a pen and a number two pencil, and I want you to write down the four noble truths. Pass them, pass them in, and I will grade them. <laughs> By the way, the four noble truths, if you're trying to, to rack your brain, are the, the first noble truth is, is dukkha, which is that suffering, human existence, is characterized by suffering. The second noble truth is that suffering has an origin, a cause. The third noble truth is that because suffering has a cause and an origin, it can be eliminated, that suffering can be conquered and overcome. And then the fourth noble truth is that the way, the way to eliminate suffering is by following the eightfold path. And then I thought I should put on this quiz. I also name all eight path, name <laughs> all eight folds in the eightfold path. That's the extra credit. And so, and then I realized that this that this thought, uh, how many how many you know, you can't name at least two of the uh, four noble truths, and I'm not going to believe your answer. I realized that this thought was was pretty ungenerous and uncharitable, and not really in line with being my best self. So the first thought was. Um, a little bit of insecurity, the second thought was a little bit of anger, and the third thought was curiosity. And that's the thought I'd like to follow this morning, the curiosity. What does it mean? What does it mean that 63% of you a couple years ago said that Buddhism has been significant and important to your religious development? What are you seeking and finding in Buddhism? What is the attraction of Buddhism? And by the way, I will say that this is the first of two sermons I'm going to give this month that has the word attraction in the title. Uh, in two weeks, um, very, very different than this sermon, in two weeks I'm going to be preaching a sermon with the title, The Attraction of Vampires. Um, and that sermon will ask the question of why our culture finds vampires entertaining from movies to television shows to books. Um, last year, I, this is the, the Sunday before Halloween, the Sunday before Halloween, I'm going to talk about monsters until you get sick of hearing me do that. Last year it was zombies. This year it's vampires. When somebody said, well, next year is that going to be werewolves? I said, probably. <laughs> but this morning is Buddhism. As it turns out, um, one of the things that may interest you to know is that there's actually a long history of connection between Buddhism and Unitarian Universalism. The first Buddhist text to be printed, to be published in English, was a translation of a chapter of the Sadharma Pundarika Sutra, more commonly known as the Lotus Sutra, that was published in 1844 in a, a Unitarian Transcendentalist uh, um, journal, the Dial, that was founded by Ralph Waldo Emerson. The translation appeared anonymously, although historians would later conclude that it had been translated by Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, a Boston Unitarian who was most famous for opening America's first kindergarten. So I love, I love that, that it was, a, it was a, a kindergarten principal, a kindergarten founder, um, who also happened to be the first person to introduce the, the West to Buddhism. Reportedly, Henry David Thoreau was so struck by this text that he began to claim that he himself was a Buddhist. 
And nearly 50 years later, Unitarians played an instrumental role in planning the first ever World Parliament of Religions held in Chicago in 1893. This was a conference of religions from around the world that was planned to coincide with the World Fair happening in Chicago that year. And for the first time ever um, at this event, speakers um, from religious traditions that had never been invited to speak in the United States before came. Um, Swami Vivekananda came from India, introducing the West to Hinduism, and a Japanese Zen abbot uh, spoke and is believed that 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 is the first uh, Zen practitioner to give a Dharma talk in the West at an event hosted by Uh, largely organized by Unitarians in Chicago in 1893. This past summer here at the community church, uh, church member Bill Waltrip offered a spiritual education for adults class in which participants read books about Buddhism and then discussed those books. I wrote to the participants in that class to tell me about what drew them to Buddhism and how they incorporate Buddhism into their lives. And here are a few of the responses I received from members of this church, participants in this class. One member of the class wrote, I incorporate Buddhist teachings and practices in my life daily through meditation, personal interactions, and trying to see things through the viewpoint of Buddhist thought. I've learned that through meditation, I can find a unique space in my mind which can include truth, peace, and rest. I'm learning to be in the moment real as it is. Another class member wrote, I like that Buddhism represents more of a practice, a way to live a healthy life both physically and mentally, than a theology. Through mindfulness and meditation, Buddhism has helped me let go of unhealthy attachments, curb my anxiety, and be more present in my relationships. A third wrote, I had wanted to learn more about Buddhism for a long time, but until this summer's reading group, I dipped into it only sporadically. Over the years, especially as a UU, I had read or heard occasional Buddhist quotations, which seemed to fit right in with my perspective on life. I had read previously a Thich Nhat Hanh book on mindfulness, which noticeably improved my ability to deeply appreciate the present moment and keep my worries at more of a distance. The one Buddhist practice that I do apply fairly consistently is mindfulness. I consciously use mindfulness to handle stress and anxiety. Although I know fairly little about Buddhism, I still feel that I can call myself in some way a Buddhist. And a fourth participant wrote, my personal interest is that Buddhism does not require a hierarchical belief system, or a hierarchical clergy, but insists that the Dharma, the teachings, are enough to guide our lives, a secular moral lifestyle. One of my dearest friends in ministry um, serves a congregation in Iowa, and uh, she's written about engaging in Buddhist spiritual practices as a UU, and um, she's my she's my go-to person who I ask um, when I say, "Hey, I am I am stuck in Western thought. I need I need your Eastern thought to balance me out." And so I wrote to my friend Eva, and I asked her. I said, "Why do you think Eva? Why do you think Unitarian Universalists are attracted to Buddhism?" And here is how uh, she replied. I'm going to read from her answer. One of the reasons. I can think of why you use would be attracted to Buddhism has to do with actually a misunderstanding that Buddhism is a religion without divinity. That's just not true. The vast majority of the world's Buddhists conceive of deities and have an understanding of divinity. But especially in the case of Buddhism as it's practiced in the West, having a specific concept of God is not in any way a necessary requirement. And this, this fact, I tend to find it really sits well with most you use. Another reason, she writes, that Buddhism is attractive to you use is that Buddhism has academic respectability. A lot of people who helped bring Buddhism to the West in greater numbers in the 60s and 70s, 1960s and 70s, were professors and academics. American Zen centers sprung up primarily, almost exclusively, in academic communities. Take someone 
She writes like John Kabat-Zinn. He's the author of the popular book, Wherever You Go, There You Are, that came out 25 years ago. John Kabat-Zinn was also the founder of the Cambridge Zen Center. But he's also a professor of medicine and the founder of an academic center called the Stress Reduction Clinic and the Center for Mindfulness in Medicine. When he's asked to identify religiously, he says, I'm not a Buddhist, I'm a scientist. Which is interesting because he's teaching meditation. That's what his center studies is meditation. When MIT wants to study the human brain, they form a partnership, a deep partnership with the Dalai Lama. Eva said, I'm willing to bet that a large percentage of your members who are baby boomers read westernized books about Buddhism during the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And the younger generation grew up having experienced yoga and meditation and a Beastie Boys song where they wrapped the Bodhisattva vow. My friend Eva continues, another reason that Western liberals are drawn to Buddhism and this certainly is true to me, is that it is very prescriptive. If Jesus says, turn the other cheek, you're left to wonder, how do you do that exactly? Buddha says, here, let me show you how to learn how to do that. Most religions tell us what to believe and what the expected norms for behavior are, but Buddhism sets forth a path, explain that it's going to be a practice, and lays out eight steps on how to actually be the person you strive to be in the world. So I asked my colleague, I I shouldn't give the people in the church, I shouldn't give them a pop quiz and ask them what the Four Noble Truths were. (laughs) No, Eva said, you shouldn't. You know, it's our left side of our brains that hold down facts, like the Four Noble Truths, but it's the right side of our brain that holds our emotional fields. And my guess is that what's resonating with Buddhism is that it's a way of allowing all of these left-brained people who live in a world of of facts to get in touch with those right-brained emotional fields in a deeper way. Eva finished by sharing that at the Buddhist group she attends, they have, each time they meet, a period of teaching and dharma, a time of chanting, a time of meditation, but they also have a check-in when people talk about how they've used Buddhism. The people in her Buddhist group report that the significance of Buddhism in their lives from week to week mostly is about calming them down in moments of anxiety, which is what the members of our class said that they found in Buddhist practice. Calming them down in moments of anxiety so they can more closely act like the people they want to be from the middle old man suffering from life-altering health deterioration to the middle-aged man relearning a healthy lifestyle after a heart attack to the mother who doesn't want to scream at her kid when he's trying her patience to the college student wrestling with the pain of a fellow dorm mate committing suicide. So those are the comments from my friend and colleague about the attraction of Buddhism. Makes sense to me. Makes sense to me. So as you go forth, as you go forth, I invite you to explore practices that are not familiar to you. I thank you for, I thank you for uh, listening to this Western boy talk about what he knows about Eastern thought. And I invite you to be that lion, to be that lion interrupting, getting in the way of others who harm themselves needlessly. Whenever you feel like that timid, timid rabbit, find it within your courage, within the peace of who you are, to be that gentle and compassionate, strong lion moving the world, moving the world from harm to healing. Amen. Blessed be.